I ended the last lecture segment talking about safe and effective ways to transfer patients. Now we're going to talk about um, how, do, how do we determine whether a patient is ready to get up and ambulate. So I'm going to title this section, Are You Able to Amble? First thing that we need to know before we make this determination are the vital signs. And now this is for someone who's maybe three days post-op and they haven't been up. You don't have to go through all of this if you have, say, a nursing home patient who does this every day for the last two years. This is if you're not sure how somebody transfers or if you're not sure that they're ready to um, walk down the hall or not. So the first thing we're going to do are vital signs. Vital signs before and two minutes after being upright. And the reason that we're going to do them both before and after is the main thing we're looking for is what we call orthostatic hypotension. And that has to do with the blood pressure. That's one of the complications of immobility is that when someone's immobile for a period of time, their heart loses the ability to um, compensate for changes in position, kind of forgets. And so what happens is they'll be feeling great as long as they're uh, lying down. And then the second we get them up, all of a sudden, all of their blood just whooshes towards gravity, so into their feet, and leaves their blood pressure really low, and they feel awful. They get pale, they get shaky, they might faint, and um, we have to watch out for that. So we're going to do the vital signs before, and then after they get up, we give time for anything bad to happen that is going to happen. Then we're going to check them again and check for that orthostatic hypotension. The way that we would tell is the top number would drop 20 points or more, and the bottom number would drop 10 points or more. We also have to anticipate if they're going to have pain. So if they've broken their hip and this is the first or second time they're going to get up to walk, we don't have to wait until they say, okay, my pain's an eight. We can do what's called anticip anticipatory pain premedication, meaning that, yeah, they're not in pain right now, but I'm going to get them up and walk them in the hall and I know it's going to hurt. Why wouldn't it hurt if you have a broken hip? And so anytime that we anticipate pain, that's the one time we can kind of cheat on our pain scale. Normally, pain's what the patient says it is, right? And so if they're lying in bed and they say their pain's a zero or a one, we believe them. True. However, that's not a good reason to avoid giving them pain medication when you know that what they're going to do is going to cause pain. So we pre-medicate. A uh, 30 minute window is a, a good time when they're going to get up and do mobility either with us or with PT. Then we need to determine their level of mobility. Do we need more staff, for instance? How much can they help? And then their strength, coordination, and balance. We're going to always start with a gait belt. When in doubt, use a gait belt. And really, I think gait belts are a good idea no matter what. Everyone needs a gait belt. <laughs> Um, you're just safer with one of those. It's safer for everybody. We also need to determine what assistive devices we might need. Are we going to need a walker or a wheelchair? And we want to have every piece of equipment that we're, we need assembled before we get someone up. The last thing you want to do is get someone up and go to all that effort and, oh yeah, your wheelchair's across the room or your walker's across the room. So have everything ready. You want your environment free of obstacles. So if you're going to ambulate somebody out their door and into the hall, make sure the pathway is clear because again, you don't want to wait until you have a hold of the gate belt with your one hand and with your foot and your other hand, you're trying to scoot everything out of their path. So make sure the walk the path that you're going to walk with the patient, make sure that it's free of obstacles, anything that they might trip on or get hung up on. Think about where you're going and establish resting points along the way. A lot of facilities have a railing all along the walls and so that's good if someone needs a little bit more stability. Or maybe you need one of your um, coworkers to follow along with the wheelchair so that the patient can sit down at any time. A family member is excellent to use for that too. They love to follow along with the wheelchair behind. Or maybe you need to set up some wheelchairs or something for your patient to take a break. And finally, always make sure we have something on their feet, non-skid shoes, where they make those socks with the little rubber things on them. Shoes are a lot better, but the very worst thing that you can ever walk somebody in is Ted hose. 
unless they're covered with something. But those things are extremely slippery. It's like trying to walk in pantyhose. So if your patient has TED hose on, I'm not saying they can't walk with TED hose. They do that all the time. Just make sure that there's something else on top of the TED hose on their feet. So shoes and socks or the non-skid slippers. Don't ever walk somebody just in TED hose. After we've helped somebody ambulate, then we're going to document. And our documentation may include if we checked their vital signs before, during, and after, we will include those in the documentation. Um, the distance, walked in feet, sometimes we have to estimate that, and that's fine. What devices were used? Did you um, use a wheelchair? Did you use a walker, crutches, cane, whatever? The amount of staff assistance required, and that's very important, so that when the oncoming nurse maybe goes to do the same thing, the oncoming nurse will know how many staff members to gather up and what devices and everything. And then the patient's response, and I have good or bad, meaning you do not put the patient tolerated it good <laughs> or the patient tolerated it bad, and that's not what I mean with that. I mean whether the patient's response are, is good or bad, we're gonna include that in our documentation. So if the walk went well, then we'll include a note about that, that they did not have any major changes in vital signs, didn't become short of breath, minimal pain, or if it was bad, then we'll include that. Did they have orthostatic hypotension? Did they become nauseated? Did they their pain go from a level two to a level eight with ambulation or whatever the response was, we're gonna include that in our documentation. Here's some more practice questions. This first question says, when preparing to move or position a patient, the nurse should first, and oops, let me get your choices where you can see them here. Assemble adequate help to facilitate the change. Assess the patient's ability to assist with the change. Determine the effect of the patient's weight on the change, or decide upon the most effective method to facilitate the change. And I don't know how to make my screen bigger to see that. So what do you think? Okay, the correct answer was assess the patient's ability. So this is a prioritization question, meaning that all of the answers are going to be correct, but what we have to determine is which one we would do first. So let's talk about why things are wrong. Assemble adequate help to facilitate the change. Yes, that was one of the things I mentioned, right? But how much help we need is going to depend on the patient's ability. So we have to do this first, and then that will help us determine how much help we need. Again, the effect of the patient's weight. We can have a very, very heavy person, let's say 500 pound person. And if they are unable to help, then we're gonna need a lift and a lot of people to change their position, right? But we have some people that are quite heavy that really don't need that much help. They, they can still walk, although they might have a little bit of immobility, but their ability to help will change everything. So it's more important to know how much they can assist rather than how much they weigh. And then the method that we're gonna use also has to do with how much assistance that they can give. Let's look at another one. Which of the following patients should be allowed to lie back down? A patient who was just transferred to a chair and states that she was more comfortable in bed. Physician's orders are to be up in the chair twice daily. Number two, a patient whose blood pressure was 120 over 80 prior to transfer and is now 112 over 78. Number three, a patient who complains of feeling dizzy and slightly nauseous when dangling on the bedside. And four, a patient whose blood pressure went from 110 over 70 to 125 over 80. Well, I'm thinking this patient number three. Number one patient, and those are really hard for me because I don't like to make people do what they don't want to do. Yeah, the patient who is feeling dizzy. Let's look back at these though. This patients never want to get out up after surgery and we have to, I don't want to say that we make them, but we strongly encourage them because of course it's more comfortable lying in bed, but you're going to die if you don't get up. I mean, that's not necessarily what you have to tell the patient, but we have to be kind of firm about that sometimes. 
As far as this blood pressure, I told you if the top number drops 20 points, so this top number dropped just 8 points, so that didn't make the parameter. Or if the bottom number jump, drops 10 points, and this time it only dropped 2, so we're okay with this one. This one feeling dizzy uh, is a definite no, no, they need to lay, lie back down. And then this person's blood pressure actually went up. And that's what's supposed to happen. Um, getting up is work. And anytime we work, um, our blood pressure impulse should rise. And so this is more of the common, what we would expect to see. And you are to get a patient with right-sided weakness up in a chair. On what side of the bed will you place the chair? the left side, the weak side, either side, or whichever side the patient prefers. Again, I'm notorious for doing number four, but that's not the right answer. If they have right-sided weakness, we need to get them up on their left side. It's just um, really awkward for them to do anything on their right side. So always go on the stronger side. At Jim Thorpe, when I worked there, we always tried if we had a bunch of stroke patients. That was our bread and butter there, what we did. And so we had a lot of people who were flaccid on one side or the other. And we even tried to make the room arrangements to accommodate them. So if they were flaccid on their left side, they would have a room where um, their bed was such that um, their strong side faced the door. And so we would put them on whichever side of the hall best accommodated their, their strong side. Gate belts. So we're done with questions. Gate belts are not restraints, first of all, so we don't have to um, fill out any kind of restraint paperwork for them, even though they look like they might be a restraint. They're not. Um, supporting the patient by a hold on the arm is incorrect because a nurse cannot easily support the patient's weight to lower him or her to the floor if needed. I talked earlier about how that's a good way to dislocate somebody's arm as well as injure yourself. Um, underarm holds increase the risk of shoulder joint dislocation. Bad for the patient, bad for nursing assistant or nurse whoever's helping. So here is um, a picture of hopefully if you do your assessment that we've been talking about, your vital signs, and are you able to amble, and you've gone through all of that, you're, you can avoid this. But occasionally, this might happen. And if you do have a patient starting to faint on you, um, you're going to be very thankful that you remember to put their gait belt on. And so here, this leg is used kind of like a slide. So imagine using your leg to make a slide. He's got him gripped on both sides, and you're just going to let the patient slide down your leg with their, their rumple, slide down your leg, and then you go down with them. If you try to remain standing, you're going to hurt your back. So let the patient slide, and then you go down on the floor with them. And then that way, if he's truly passing out, he's not going to be able to hold his head up, so you can kind of cradle his head and keep the head from hitting on the floor too. This still counts as a fall, and... Even though we did it perfectly in textbook, we still have to go through all the hassle of filling out incident report and that a fall happened. This picture says use your equipment, not your coworkers. And nurses are notorious for that. We don't want to take the time to go and get the lift, so we'll pick on our CNAs, right? Come help me lift this patient. And so if you've been a CNA and you've had that happen to you, I bet that you're probably better than average about not doing that when you become a nurse. But we need to use our equipment, not our coworkers, when someone's too difficult to lift. Here's another question. When preparing to safely transfer a patient from bed to wheelchair, the nurse should first, again, here's a priority question, determine the patient's arm strength, assess the patient's weight bearing ability, assess the patient's willingness to cooperate, or decide upon the most appropriate transfer method. This is really similar to the question we just answered, and the answer is quite similar too. Assess the patient's willingness to cooperate. Um, how much the patient can help and their willingness to help makes a lot of difference on how we're going to handle the transfer. Although these interventions are appropriate and will ensure patient staff and safety, they are not the initial action because other option has a more generalized effect on the environment, or I mean on the intervention.